I welcome our next physical speaker, Dr. Jan Rosam. He will talk uh, to us about digital assets, implications for institutions and market infrastructure. Okay. Thanks to our team for that. disinfecting everything every time. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here again uh, at the conference uh, this year, also being uh, SUY, one of the sponsors. So, um, yeah, my name is Jan Rosam. I'm a partner at uh, EY uh, in the technology consulting practice, and I'm responsible for our blockchain solutions for financial services institutions. And in that context, um, um, I, I was here already six months ago, uh, as well as uh, Benjamin and the others uh, presenting under the same title, so basically implications for financial institutions and market infrastructure. And I think, uh, as, as Benjamin was saying, there has been a lot of development, a lot of uh, moving forward on certain aspects, and therefore the title is still relevant. So um, I think we all agree, and we have seen presentations uh, today and yesterday around the why 2020 and 2021 have been two of the key years for the adoption of digital assets. And uh, Benjamin just talked about the German uh, Securities, uh, Digital Securities Act, which of course is a breakthrough from a legal perspective in many different aspects, but specifically, of course, in the adoption of DLT technology. We have seen a lot of interesting transactions recently, um, specifically from a capital markets perspective. We have seen the European Investment Bank, for example, issuing the first digital bond, which of course is very interesting because uh, those guys are one of the benchmark, um, um, yeah, benchmark issuer uh, in, in capital markets, securities, uh, capital markets. So therefore, there have been a lot of aspects and I think there will be a lot of talks uh, around why at the moment there is so much uh, drive in the market from different aspects, but also from, from a demand perspective. But uh, to, to build on what has been said by Michael from Cashlink and also uh, Benjamin is really what we are seeing is that we will see a development of a new market infrastructure, which is required due to the fact that, of course, the, the, these digital assets are uh, working in a different way, but also requiring an, a DLT technology. And uh, I think I talked a lot about this uh, six months ago, what needs to happen in order to see this transformation, but I think uh, four aspects are key for this uh, transformation process. The first one, of course, is regulation. So we need an open-minded regulation. We need uh, regulators to support and uh, embrace DLT technology and uh, also in embracing a kind of decoupling uh, of traditional roles in the uh, current capital markets. So I think we see this with the Electronic Securities Act. We see partially this in the DLT pilot regime, but of course we need to emphasize the regulation regulators need to embrace this technology because I think it's clear that if the market is not happening on a regulated infrastructure, it will happen on an unregulated infrastructure, which we probably all don't want. So the second aspect is really around security. So I think it's a key aspect of uh, DLT technology. So it's, uh, it's trusted and secure. So security is a really important fact and also compliance, making sure that the solution we have is compliant. Um, we have seen just recently in Germany a new law coming out uh, around uh, anti-money laundering. So the third aspect, and I think Benjamin uh, mentioned this as well, is we need to we need to, to to emphasize that why are we doing this? We want to have a cost-efficient, simplified uh, operating model. So and therefore, I think it's really important to keep this in mind when we build the infrastructure, because a lot of models we see uh, at the moment to be proposed, or which we probably hear about in the next uh, uh, next couple of days, seems from someone who is coming from a traditional uh, um, infrastructure perspective or traditional banker very complex. So therefore. Uh, which need to keep in mind, we want a cost-efficient infrastructure in the simplified infrastructure. And of course, the fourth point is, is around standardization. So market standardization, development of best practice, um, and also this refers to tokens, but also to processes and to, um, uh, to different protocols. So therefore, I think this standardization needs to happen and simplification to see a mass adoption from my perspective. But uh, when you look at this picture and you see all these market participants and probably changing their, their rules, so the question is, what are these new roles? And I think um, we, we see a lot of talks uh, today or we saw yesterday, and I think you can put 
everyone in kind of these boxes. So from my perspective, there are about uh, six new roles which are developed or which are basically now in the market um, to, uh, to support the market in the uh, digital asset space. So the first one is what we call the tokenizers. So it's a kind of a service providers which help issuers uh, of uh, digital assets uh, in the tokenization and the issuance of tokens uh, on the blockchain technology. They also support in the order process and probably connect the uh, investors to the issuer, which is a new service and a new functionality. Uh, also traditional uh, um, financial institutions need to think about whether they want to move into that. We see the crypto register, uh, which uh, Benjamin mentioned, so which, is a new, um, uh, which is a new service which needs to be licensed under the German regulation, so therefore it offers also a new possibility as a service um, as a service provider to dive into this. But of course it comes with liabilities and uh, regulatory requirements. So then in the middle we see, um, we call them digital asset custodian. Um, of course uh, this is, as we think, the building block in the middle, so because the digital custodian needs to be connected to all of these other players to make sure that the infrastructure works and that the operation works around digital assets. And of course, they are responsible for uh, building the uh, connectivity to the underlying network. And we have digital asset marketplaces. Of course, I could call this exchange, but I think we will see going forward a lot of different marketplaces to appear. I think this is uh, one of the biggest uh, new market or new development we see under the EU pilot regime if it goes through as we all hope, uh, to kind of liberating the market and seeing definitely more marketplaces uh, to come up. And then underneath this kind of, you could call it application layer, you see infrastructure providers appear. So one is definitely uh, someone needs to run all this hardcore infrastructure, the network, and of course we see uh, inf providers around compliance and analytics for DLT networks. So, so therefore, I think all of these new roles are basically uh, additional roles which appear due to the development of digital assets. And the discussion we are having with financial institutions, not just banks, but also other players, is really kind of what of these roles do you really want to play going forward? And those roles, of course, depend on your business model. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, we will also see not every bank will jump into all of these boxes. Therefore, it needs to be carefully assessed. Uh, it needs to be understood. There are licenses, liability behind some of these uh, um, uh, service offerings. And of course, the more of these boxes you offer, the more sophisticated technology stack you need. So therefore, one of the key aspects is really, and I think we have seen a couple of models already appearing uh, in the previous talks, is how will the underlying, let's say, uh, blockchain infrastructure look like? So, and uh, my, my idea is really to, um, uh, to define them in three different models. And so, and I think uh, these type of models are not, uh, so those are kind of generic models which apply to different asset classes. So we will see for different digital assets, different market infrastructure. I think it's, uh, for me at least, uh, it's unrealistic to believe that for all digital assets, we will have the same infrastructure. I think we have already mentioned it before, certain regulation does require certain infrastructure to be placed. And therefore there are kind of three models. So uh, the first one I call a centralized model. Um, so basically, it shows that the uh, traditional financial institutions basically stay in the infrastructure they are in the moment. At the moment, that only certain, uh, let's say, call them gatekeepers or CSDs or exchanges or I call them bridges, basically um, allow uh, market participants basically to access the blockchain. So therefore, uh, this is a model which uh, we might see. I think it's also clear for me that not all market participants need to run their own nodes in their blockchain technology. So therefore, this is what I call the centralized model. So the second one, and I think we heard about this kind of multi-layer, protocol layer, different type of models, is what I call the multi-chain model. So because it is, I think it appears, or it's obvious uh, when you hear, hear to the uh, different speakers that it's not just one blockchain, so we will appear in a multi-chain environment. So where we need to uh, make sure and need to handle all these different protocols, these different networks, uh, with all their pros and cons. So therefore, 
uh, what we will see is basically that we have different uh, blockchain networks which appear. Uh, some call them, uh, we, we need a German blockchain. Um, I mean, we heard the term about asset uh, chain, so, but still, those, all, those, uh, all these uh, uh, blockchains need to interact with each other. So, and of course, there's a lot of benefits for doing it uh, because uh, we heard from, from Cashlink previously that uh, um, being on a public blockchain sometimes is, uh, is not the best way. I mean, in a stressed market, we see a lot of issues uh, around performance. So, therefore, it makes sense to transfer the asset to another uh, chain and then basically have a smooth operations on, on, a, on a different blockchain. And of course, then the third model is the fully decentralized model where everyone basically is connected connected, has a, their own node, and runs on, on a decentralized network on a blockchain technology. And, and therefore, I think uh, when, you, when you look at uh, or when you assess all these different uh, uh, proposed models, then I think you can box them in one of those uh, general uh, models. And I think we will see for different uh, digital assets, uh, different models uh, to appear. So therefore, um, it's, uh, it's uh, important specifically from an architecture perspective. And I think what is also important and what is shown here on this picture, not everyone needs to run a node on the blockchain technology. And, and because the technical um, uh, hurdles uh, behind this are need to be understood uh, very well. So therefore, uh, if, we, if we summarize, um, uh, of course, um, how can we as EY uh, help uh, financial institutions? I think uh, we will talk about this also on our, uh, on our panel, which is following up. So therefore, I think it's important, as I said, uh, you as a financial institution, as an organization, need to understand what is my role, uh, what clients do I have at the moment, uh, how do I serve them, what is my role in the current market and how does that translate into the new digital asset market. So you need to come up with an overall strategy. Of course, you need to think about uh, what is a target operating model look like in an IT technology stack. And of course, the third point, which I think is still a very limiting factor is, uh, is education. So, um, I mean, uh, I, I believe that if we want to see a full mass adoption in the, uh, in the market, then we need to educate much more people. We need to get much more people involved. And I think uh, that's also what we've seen here at the conference. The uh, level of participation increased uh, uh, every year, which is good. So, uh, how can we help financial institutions? Uh, so, we have developed an end-to-end -end solution for uh, financial institutions. So, we support from a consulting perspective around strategy, uh, business uh, requirements, technology and development of target operating models. Uh, we have a specific finance risk and compliance practice uh, to support you in the uh, new product approval process, but also in any kind of compliance questions around uh, digital assets and of course we have a legal and tax uh, uh, practice to support you in the STO process but also to make sure that you're compliant uh, towards any kind of regulation and uh, on top of this we uh, have our own tools so we have a global blockchain team which develops an, uh, our blockchain tools and we have just been announced a couple of weeks ago that we will spend another 100 million US dollar in the next couple of years in further developing uh, our blockchain solutions and we're also part of the Ethereum um, blockchain community in contributing to the open source code and um, finally um, we have, uh, um, we just run our Global Blockchain Summit uh, two weeks ago, so if you're interested, then feel free to have a look at the replay. And uh, we also produce very regularly uh, our podcasts around digital assets and blockchain technology. And uh, last but not least, um, uh, we have three talks at this conference at this time. So the third one is uh, from Manuel Klein around CBDC development. And therefore, um, thank you very much for listening. And um, I'm looking forward to maybe one or two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jan Rosam from EY, everyone. There is actually one question so far. Um, in the completely decentralized uh, model architecture that you just presented, where will reliable data come from? Because when a lot of, let's say, de somewhat decentralized structures are interconnected, you have this um, false data in, false data out problem, right? Could you elaborate on that? 
No, of course. I mean, that's the reason why I show all these three models. So, and there are definitely pros and cons, and there are all discussions. And as Benjamin was saying, I think we are on the early stage to make a decision of where we want to go. And I think if you look at these models from a technical perspective, of course, everyone would uh, lean towards the decentralized world. But if you see it from a regulatory perspective, of course, they would be more interested in more centralization because then it's easy for them to regulate the market. So therefore, there are many aspects around security, uh, how to regulate this infrastructure versus the uh, uh, gaining the advances of the technology. And I think that that's, uh, has always been the play in the financial service industry. So we need to find the consensus, and uh, hopefully it's a good consensus. Okay, great. Um, I, I just heard there's a second question. Um, it's quite general, so okay. maybe <laughs> add your own flavor to that. Yeah. Um, how does digital asset accounting work? And especially in the regard of, for example, Tesla and Bitcoin, what we just experienced. I think the question came up because you're at AY, right? Yeah, exactly. So I'm not, the, not an auditor, so therefore I cannot comment on any kind of accounting rules <laughs> for this. Um, but of course, I mean, um, I think one of the challenges every bank will have is, of course, the volatility on these assets. So, I mean, uh, I think that's the reason why not, not many banks actually dived into trading of these uh, instruments because it's uh, highly volatile and it's of course at the moment specifically when you look at the cryptocurrency markets very illiquid market so therefore of course the valuation is a topic which needs to be looked at also the risk control around these assets and also the hedging so and i mean even the the big big ones uh, are not uh, trading in these assets and of course Uh, those are some factors which need to be considered when you when you start uh, booking them on your own own book. But again, I mean, I can the the person can contact me. I can uh, forward the accounting specific questions. There are a lot of tax issues. I mean, we we have a lot of contact with uh, uh, fintechs and neo banks around uh, tax implications. I mean, DeFi is uh, the biggest stopper at the moment. Is around tax. So, but I think. We have a lot of lawyers, I think, at this conference, so they will probably talk about all these implications. Okay, great. And the last question, maybe um, real quick, what is your take on non-custodial um, crypto storage or storage of digital assets in general? Yeah, no, as um, uh, if you look at my pictures uh, uh, correctly, so then you will see that uh, not everyone has basically access to the blockchain. So therefore, I think it's uh, uh, it will be up to the uh, to the to the financial institutions or specifically to those who want to offer custodial services, which will not be everyone, is my take. So and uh, of course they need to think about what are they going to offer. So and uh, I mean we as a retail clients or as a customers or used to basically having an app which is open so we can transfer assets around. But I think this is not the, 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 the overall way forward for financial institutions because, of course, we need to control the transactions. We need to sh make sure where does the money come from, how does the transaction go. So therefore, I think um, uh, the, the models you described is probably something which will uh, appear specifically around uh, in, when financial institutions typical French institutions in a regulated market will offer their custody services. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Rosam.